people don't know what I look like until now. Until they start going to the movies, they're gonna see my face. Big deal. Yo, what's good? OMG Hawk, one man gang, back at y'all with another one. I'm nice! The shit that I write could win a Pulitzer. Ratchet on the side of my hip. Don't make me pull it, sir. You already know. I hope everyone is well as always. Congratulations, we made it to February. Valentine's Day is coming soon, so I suppose it's time to either get those gifts ready or start that breakup argument you've been plotting. But more importantly, Happy Black History Month to everybody. It's always a good time to appreciate greatness in our culture. We've come a long way in a short period of time, and although the struggle continues, we should always make time to acknowledge the fearless men and women that paved the way for us and just made our culture as fly as it is today. If you're here for the first time, I appreciate you stopping by. If you end up liking the video, make sure you hit the subscribe button, and I'll keep them coming back for a second or a third time i especially appreciate you and you already know the details in today's video are disturbing and viewer discretion is advised let's get right to it the events in today's video bring us to one of my personal favorite cities new york new york but more specifically king's county better known as the borough of brooklyn brooklyn is new york city's most populated borough home to about 2.7 million people Brooklyn is home to many historic neighborhoods that have given us countless street legends, celebrities, and athletes. Brooklyn was at one time deep-rooted in many ethnic cultures, divided by neighborhood blocks, but still coexisting for many decades with the unmatched unity and prideful attitude that could only be described as being Brooklyn. In recent years, the borough's dynamic has changed drastically due to gentrification, but Brooklyn still has a lot of the same cultured spots and I personally always enjoy myself there. Much love to Juices for Life Brooklyn on Malcolm X Boulevard. I'll be back real soon. I still need to try to bark. The fall of 1997 was hectic in Brooklyn. The world had just lost Biggie and although the summer brought us all about the Benjamins on Puff's album, the streets were still as real as ever in Crown Heights where then 20-year-old new Sean Williams was staying in the Albany houses with a friend, his friend's girl, and her mother. Like many young people caught up in the everyday struggle at the time, new Sean turned to the crack game, and in September, he got caught selling crack to an undercover cop in the Bronx and was locked up on Rikers Island. This is where he was when he made national headlines about a month later. Not for a drug case, but in the form of a public health alert from an upstate New York County Health Department to the likes of which America had never seen before. This alert invoked fear and panic in the state of New York and would send over a thousand people rushing to local health clinics in one upstate county alone. At a time when HIV and AIDS were still heavily stigmatized and considered a walking death sentence, Nushon was now the New York State AIDS monster, accused of knowingly exposing hundreds of women and girls to HIV through unprotected sex between 1996 and 1997. Yes, you heard correctly, hundreds. New Sean Williams was born on November 1st, 1976, and lived in the Crown Heights neighborhood of Brooklyn his whole childhood. His family had an apartment in the Radcliffe building on Eastern Parkway, and by all accounts, he had a hard knock life from day one. As his mother was on drugs, Niggas moms on crack, but and his father was never in the picture. His uncle was the man of the apartment, but prison bids kept him away more often than not, so essentially him and his sisters were raised by his great-grandmother and his grandmother in their Brooklyn apartment. Now his great-grandmother, Thelma Cooper, was the real rock of the family. She kept all the children well-dressed and made everyone attend church. But unfortunately, her efforts were no match for the crack epidemic that rocked Crown Heights in the mid to late 80s. New Sean's mom would get caught up bad and neighbors even told Newsweek that his mother was selling herself and even her daughter for crack money, although she denied these allegations. Child welfare was a regular at her home and one of her daughters was placed in foster care while another one was formally adopted. A caseworker told the New York Times that it is possible New Sean spent some time in foster care as well, but this information is confidential. New Sean took special ed classes at PS 161 until he dropped out at age 14. 
Now, new Sean, known to his neighbors and friends in Crown Heights as JoJo, would really start wilding out in his adolescence. His great-grandmother had passed away, and his grandmother put him out due to his behavior. Now, by some accounts, he was just a desperate kid roaming the streets with no direction, but still good-spirited. He was liked by many neighbors who watched him grow up and seemed empathetic to him since they saw firsthand how rough he had it. By other accounts, he was a ruthless stick-up kid known to even beat and rob elderly people for a couple dollars. Now without a home, Jojo spent his time squatting in a known crack house in the neighborhood or walking around the streets up to no good. He was convicted of a robbery at age 15, and according to his mother, by the time Jojo hit 16, he was completely out of control as he was robbing Brooklyn warehouses at gunpoint and setting fires in an abandoned building next to the Radcliffe. She called family court and had Jojo placed in a group home in an effort to get him off the streets and redirect his life. The group home setting didn't help much as Jojo seemed to be more ill-behaved than ever and his mother got him back after about a year. It's reported that in 1993, a 17-year-old new Sean attempted to rob a record shop in his neighborhood and ended up shooting the owner in the hand. The owner never pressed charges as he knew Jojo from the neighborhood and was quoted saying he'd rather let God do his work. About a year later, Nushon was arrested for a machete attack in Queens that ended a man's life and spent a year in the infamous C-74 housing unit for adolescents on Rikers Island fighting the case. He was found not guilty by a jury in 1995 and walked out the courthouse a free man. Unfortunately, by this time, his grandmother had fell victim to addiction and had lost the apartment in the Radcliffe. Jojo ended up back in the streets of Crown Heights, often staying at the same crack house he would frequent in the past. Jojo started selling crack and would eventually start getting high himself. Late that year, while hanging out in the Albany houses, he met a girl from Jamestown, New York, a city about a little more than an hour south of Buffalo in upstate Chautauqua County. Jojo took the Greyhound upstate to Jamestown with her in efforts to expand his drug business to new markets. Now at the time, going OT, as it was commonly referred to in street culture, was popular among big city dealers. Now, besides having less competition in a smaller town, the work could sell for double or even triple the price that the same amount would sell for in a major city where crack was accessible virtually every other block at the time. Jojo adopted a bunch of aliases such as Face and the name Shy Teak Johnson. He would re-up on crack in Brooklyn and head OT to various spots in Jamestown, Rochester, Buffalo, and even as far as Boston and Virginia. He became somewhat successful, or at least enough to dress the part, as he started wearing fresh Tims, Peli Peli leathers, Versace shirts, big jewelry, and was known to keep a fat bankroll. A whole new world from the poverty-stricken appearance he would bop up and down the block back in Crown Heights with. Now, something else new to new Sean was the admiration he received from young small-town girls who were fascinated by the flashy big city dope boy. He was never previously regarded as a ladies' man during his earlier time in Brooklyn. Everyone just knew him as dusty-ass wild JoJo from the block. But the money and the fast life was appealing to impressionable girls in these smaller cities, and new Sean knew how to capitalize off this seemingly having a new girlfriend he was shacking up with every couple weeks and hooking up with many other girls through all these flings. New Sean would take the girls shopping in Buffalo and Erie, Pennsylvania for clothes, cassette tapes, and other small gifts before it was on to the next one. Some girls knew him as Shy Teak, some knew him by Sly, others knew him as Face. But at some point, started trading crack for sex, and many times while staying in Jamestown between girlfriends. He would stay in abandoned buildings and garages, and was even known to bring different women to these spots for intercourse. This was his routine from early 1996 until January 1997, when he left Jamestown and went back home to Crown Heights. The following month, Nushon was shot in an altercation outside the Albany projects and survived returning back home to Brooklyn for a while before drifting to the Bronx, where he would eventually get arrested in the crack sting and end up back on Rikers. He was booked in jail under one of his aliases, Shy Teak Johnson. Around the same time, 
The upstate community of Jamestown was in a panic as the county's HIV rate among young women and girls was rising at an alarming rate. HIV, or human immunodeficiency virus, is an infection that attacks a person's white blood cells and weakens the immune system. The virus is contracted by contact with HIV-infected blood, semen, or vaginal fluids, most commonly through sexual intercourse or sharing needles with infected drug users. Now AIDS, or Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome, is the later stage of HIV infection when the infected person's immune system is damaged to the point that they can no longer produce enough white blood cells to fight off infection, or they develop certain infections regardless of their white blood cell count. Now, decades of research and advances in medicine in recent times have progressed to the point that with correct treatment, HIV patients could live a full healthy life with the virus virtually undetectable. But unfortunately, this wasn't always the case. America was introduced to HIV in 1981 when a rare lung infection was found among five gay men in LA. Now, around the same time period in New York City and California, a group of men were diagnosed with an unusually aggressive cancer. By the end of 1981, there were 270 reported cases of severe immune deficiency among gay men across America, and 121 of those had died from the illness. Now, in June of 1982, another group of gay men in California had similar cases, and it was assumed at the time that the primary cause was sexual. The syndrome was initially called Gay-Related Immune Deficiency, or GRID. It was heavily stigmatized and even referred to in the media as gay cancer or gay plague. It wasn't until late June that cases of the virus were reported in hemophiliacs and Haitians, which brought in their scope of patients, and in September 1982 is when the CDC first used the term AIDS. It would be another year later when it was established that the virus could be passed through heterosexual intercourse. By the mid-1990s, although we had learned a lot about HIV and AIDS and had implemented many successful prevention programs to help slow the spread, how to treat the virus effectively was still unknown and a positive test result was still considered certain death at the time. While Nushan sat in Rikers for the drug charges, in Chautauqua County, 10 young girls had tested positive for HIV, the youngest being only 13 years old. An investigator for the county's health department was assigned the case and took on the painstaking task of interviewing all the patients and trying to identify the cause of the virus's rapid spread in the area. When comparing all his notes, he determined that the girls had to have contracted the virus through sexual intercourse, and all the girls described a similar man with different aliases that no one could locate. Now, shortly after this realization, he remembered interviewing a man in September of 1996 in Chautauqua County Jail who had tested positive for HIV and had passed the virus to people at that time as well. This man was Nushan Williams. Now, in an interview that the investigator gave to the New York Times, he had been looking for Nushan in the summer of 1996 after he received treatment at a Chautauqua County Health Clinic for venereal disease and had tested positive for HIV. At the time, test results weren't available for days, sometimes weeks, and when Nushan's results came back, he couldn't be located by the clinic. The investigator for the health department finally made contact with Nushan on September 6th while he was being held in the jail on car theft charges. The investigator informed him he was HIV positive, told him his medical options, and urged him to reveal his sexual partners in hopes that they can get tested and receive proper treatment if necessary. This last request, usually being difficult for the patient, was no problem for Nushan as he went on to recount various sexual encounters in detail in what the investigator described as almost prideful bragging. It's unclear when and how Nushan contracted HIV. It's rumored that he could have got it at the crack house he was staying before he got locked up on the murder that he was acquitted on. The owner of the residence was rumored to let people stay in exchange for sex, especially young men. His family believes he got it from a counselor at the group home he stayed at when he was 16 years old. His grandmother told reporters that the counselor acted like a big brother figure, but that Nushan later told her, quote, he gave me the germ. It also could have been one of the many prostitutes he traded crack for sex with in Brooklyn and in Jamestown. His longtime friend told Newsweek that he would get high with the girls and leave more crack on the table, 
Then he would have sex and give them the crack and maybe $5 afterwards. Rodney Pryor was a lookout for Williams, who was making three or $400 a day selling crack. But Pryor says when he went from selling to smoking crack, Williams degenerated into a homeless addict trading crack for sex. He was mostly messing with crackheads, probably like 30, 40. Needless to say, any of these high-risk interactions could have been the cause. Upon learning his misfortune, Nushan continues to have unprotected sex when interviewed by the health department investigator. He recalled from memory 28 girls in Chautauqua County and another 75 girls in New York City he had potentially infected, giving a foul new twist to the question, what's your body count? In fear that Nushan had knowingly put hundreds of people at risk, in an unprecedented move by the Chautauqua County Health Department, they received permission from the court to reveal Nushan's positive HIV status to the public in an effort to notify those who might have been exposed to unprotected sex with him. The words AIDS monster were broadcast across TV screens nationwide along with a flyer with Nushan's picture reading health alert, warning the public of Nushan's activities and urging area people to get tested. This is the face that's horrified New York's rural Chautauqua County. A 20-year-old reputed drug dealer with 10 aliases who's allegedly spread the virus that causes AIDS indiscriminately. Known to us by the name of Nushan Williams. He's also known by the name of Shaitik Johnson, the street name of Face. The panic spread quickly to Crown Heights where 10 HIV cases were linked directly to Nushan as well as many contact infections people who caught it from Nushan's partners. Now back upstate, 13 people tested positive and two babies were eventually born HIV positive that were linked to Nushan, as well as one adult male who caught it from one of Nushan's partners. His sister said he knew what he was doing. Do you think he would have sex with those girls knowing he was HIV positive? Mm, um, yeah, because he feels he don't have nothing to live for. The total number of people infected in Nushan's cluster is unknown. He was sentenced to 12 years in prison for statutory rape in the case of the 13-year-old girl who tested positive upstate. In 2010, Nushan was scheduled to be released, but on May 6th of that year, in another unprecedented turn of events, a judge ordered that he remain incarcerated as the state requested Nushan be committed for civil confinement. A law enacted in 2007 that can keep violent sexual predators confined indefinitely if the court deems that they pose an extreme risk to society. Now a judge determined civil confinement was necessary in a 2014 trial after testimony from guards and inmates that Nushan had intended to continue his behavior upon release and even specifically mentioned young girls. Experts for the state testified that Nushan had a mental abnormality that predisposed him to committing sexual misconduct and an inability to control his behavior. Nushan is still locked up to this day at Central New York Psychiatric Center in Marcy, New York, under the name Shaitik Johnson. He challenged his confinement and lost in 2016 and has since been married while incarcerated. Now, Nushan does have some support from HIV advocacy groups that feel it's not fair he be confined on the basis of his status. Others argue that it's his reckless indifference and lack of moral compass alone that should keep him in prison for the rest of his life. Yeah, wow. First and foremost, my condolences not only to the people involved in this case who passed on, but everyone who lost their lives due to the HIV AIDS epidemic. And best wishes and utmost respect to those living with the virus. Regardless of whatever lifestyle you live, the unfortunate reality that a single poor choice can severely alter your fate is hard to accept for many, but it's a cold fact. Nushan wasn't the only HIV-positive person accused of intentionally trying to infect others, but it was the first time that the health department broke confidentiality in the best interest of the public. You know, I wholeheartedly believe that a person's medical conditions are their business only, but I suppose this case raised the question, at what point does a person's reckless indifference override their right to privacy? You know, some of the girls knew Sean had infected later admitted to the health department investigator that even after testing positive, they too have been having unprotected sex with people without informing them of the risk. I might follow up on this issue with a similar case from around the same time period where a health alert wasn't issued and the effects that it had on the community. 
Lushawn is listed on the sex offender registry with his address being the facility that he's currently housed at by the Department of Corrections. The facility's website describes it as a mental health service facility for New York State inmates, but I noticed when looking at the registry, it seems like this might be where New York puts all the worst of the worst sex offenders. I'm not sure how much treatment goes on there, but Nushan is locked up with some really depraved people. Just skimming through for a few minutes made Nushan's crimes look like light work. If any New Yorkers know about the prison in Marcy, let me know in the comment section. Most importantly, let's continue to educate ourselves and properly educate others on how to be safe. Education is the first step to prevention. If you're still here, I do appreciate you. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe. Stay well and stay safe. Until next time, One Man Gang.